In this tutorial, we're going to take a first look at the new SubD tools available in Rhino 7. SubD modeling in Rhino is essentially taking a leaf out of more organic modeling softwares such as Blender or Maya, and these tools are pretty new to Rhino and don't yet quite reach the capabilities of these other softwares. So this will be a quick crash course into the basics of SubD modeling. So what is SubD modeling in Rhino? SubD is a new object type available in Rhino 7. You might be more familiar with some of the more common object types such as poly surfaces or surfaces in Rhino which constitute NURBS geometries as well as, as, well as other object types like meshes. So NURBS or non-uniform rational B-splines is a modeling technique that harnesses the power of mathematics to represent geometry. Take a sphere for instance. A sphere exists nowhere in the real world. It's actually a mathematical equation, and this equation is represented as a NURBS geometry, and it's completely smooth and has no flat faces. A sphere in mesh modeling, however, is made up from the combination of mesh faces that serve as an approximation of its surface. The geometry still looks like a sphere, but if we inspect it closely, we can see the polygonal sphere is jagged and made from smaller parts. Now, the difference with sub D is that sub-D geometries are spline-based geometries, and they're kind of like NURBS geometries. However, they are modelled from an unsmoothed base geometry, like a mesh, which enables us greater control over the manipulation of the geometry, whilst giving us a continuous representation of curved geometry, which is essentially the best of both worlds. So let's start by modelling our first object using the sub-D tools in Rhino. We're going to start with what are called sub-D primitives, and I've got a new fresh Rhino 7 file open to begin with. I'm just going to jump into this perspective mode over here, and I am going to start by modelling a sub-D plane. So make sure you go into the sub-D tools tab in Rhino 7 and click on the create sub-D plane object just here. When we click on it, we're going to be asked, as we would be, to draw a plane um, it, normally in Rhino, with a bunch of options as to how we want to draw, um, draw it. I'm going to do a typical draw of it. Um, just note that you get the option to add X and Y counts, which is basically the divisions um, of your sub d, uh, sub d geometry. So I'm just going to go and click in space, and I'll make uh, my geometry maybe 100 by 100 millimeters, and hit enter. Um, I might just change to shaded mode so we can see that more clearly. So you see that I've got a division of 2 in the x and 2 in the y direction on my base geometry. I'm also going to create a sub d box. So I'm going to click on sub d box up here. Um, I'm going to change my x, y and z count to 1, 1 and 1. And I'm going to go ahead and draw a box like this approximately the same size, and you'll see straight away that I don't actually get a box output. Um, I'm getting a sphere. So why is that? Basically, sub-D geometries have kind of two representations that we can view in Rhino. One is a smooth version of our geometry, um, which is representing that kind of continuous representation of a curved geometry. And the other is the base geometry, which is the more jagged, low-resolution version of our um, sub-D model. And to toggle between these uh, types of geometries or these previews, we can just hit the tab button in Rhino. So now you'll see the cube that I initially draw and the flat plane that I initially drew and when I tab again you'll see them both smoothed out. So objects with higher levels of division will not smooth as significantly as ones with lower um, amounts of division so it's really important to take note of your x y and z count for your geometries that you're creating. So for example if I go and create a um, another sub d box and I change my x count to 10, my y count to 10 and my z count to 10 and I'll just draw it over here. We get, you know, about a similar looking box when I, but when I hit the tab button, this guy smooths out to basically a sphere, uh, and this one retains its shape because it's got all these control points that are, you know, basically preventing the smoothing from occurring holistically around the entire object. So generally speaking, low resolution primitives are much easier to quickly work with and sketch. Um, once you get to a higher resolution, it's really difficult to easily manipulate your base geometry. When I'm modeling, I usually always begin with a box or a plane, uh, because I find them the most easiest to manipulate into other types of geometry. But there's a whole collection of other primitives that we can use to start with in sub-D that we can look at right now.
So we could come up to this tab and we can create a sub D cone. And once again, you'll have all these options that enable you to control the resolution of these objects. I'm not going to bother right now because I just want to do a quick demo of this. Um, so our cone will look something like that and we can toggle between smoothed and um, unsmoothed mode with the tab key. Um, we've also got a truncated cone, very similar tool, but just with the top taken off. Um, we have the opportunity to create a sub D cylinder. We can also create a sub D sphere. Just move that over here. And we can also create an ellipsoid, a disordered sphere, if you'd like. And the last one that we haven't looked at yet is the sub D torus. It looks something like that. And you can see how that looks as you toggle between smooth and unsmooth geometry types. So those are the base primitives that are available to us uh, in the Sub-D toolkit with Rhino. And everything you model will start from one of these things. Um, and it's about how you manipulate the geometry to create something else that is most important with these tools. So I'm going to delete a few of these things. Um, I'm going to keep the sphere and my initial um, cubes over here. So to quickly model sub-D objects in Rhino, we need to make efficient use of something called the Gumball tool. And you'll probably be familiar with this if you use Rhino quite a bit. Um, but you can turn the Gumball tool on down here. So you just come down and left click on Gumball and it'll go bold. And now when I click on an object, you'll see I get this little icon that is basically a little transformative icon. It's going to allow me to um, click on you know, the arrows and drag my geometry along a defined axis. So in this case, this is the Y axis, along the X axis, or even along the Z axis. Uh, we can also rotate our geometry, um, or we could even scale our geometry using the gumball tool. So that's a really helpful tool because it saves us having to type up here, you know, like scale in the command line to manipulate all of our objects. And because we're going to make so many small manipulations when we're modeling in sub-D, it's really important for us to have the gumball on to quickly make those changes um, on the fly. One other tool I highly recommend you turn on when you're sub-D modeling is the grid snap tool here. You'll find as you model in sub-D that um, accuracy becomes less of a major issue for you or less of a goal. Generally in Rhino, you're modeling for accuracy because you're trying to make or fabricate the things that um, you're outputting. But with sub-D modeling, it's more of like a sketching tool. Um, so if I turn on the grid snap and I scale things, it just gives me a little bit of accuracy in case I want to get um, things into a reasonably... Um, correct location but also still enables me the flexibility of freeform modeling just you know dragging things by moving scaling and rotating the other really important trick to know about the gumball tool is something called the shift control click tool um, which allows us to select into a piece of geometry. And you might be familiar with this because it exists in typical Rhino geometries um, as well. But basically if I shift control and click on the top of this uh, cube I've got here or this box, I'm able to select the top face only, which gives me the ability to easily manipulate only that top face. So I could move it, I could rotate it, or I could scale it. And I'm holding down shift to do a uniform scale, but I could also do a one directional scale by letting go of shift. I can also uh, extrude objects by hitting on that little circular button there. So that's a really important tool. It can work on edges as well. We can move, you know, particular edges. Uh, and we can also move vertices in our sub-D geometry. So this is what I was talking about before, um, where it's much easier to manipulate a low resolution uh, sub-D object than it is to manipulate a high resolution. Say, for example, if I wanted to scale this one up in the Z direction or just move this top face up, I could shift, control, and click and easily move it up. But if I wanted to do the same for this one, I suddenly have to go through and select all of these guys. If I don't get them all, I get an object that starts to look a bit distorted and ugly. So it's really important to try and keep your sub-D modeling as low resolution as possible as you're going. So one last really important tool I want to talk about with um, the gumball is if we right click on the gumball down here, we actually get a few settings that we're able to uh, turn on and off. So we can easily turn the gumball on or off. There's a few reset gumball options as well that you can look into up here. 
But most importantly, what we're interested in is these alignment gumball options. So right now we're currently aligning to an object. And what that means is if I shift control click on say this face, my gumball aligns specifically to that face. Um, and we can see this more profoundly if we actually click on the sphere. So if I go shift control click, you see my gumball now aligns to the face of that sphere. So if I shift control click on that again, and I right click on gumball, I also have the option to align the gumball to the C plane, which is this preview plane we've got here in Rhino. So if I change that, I can easily you know, go and align back. So when we wanna move things uh, in X, Y, and Z based on the world coordinates, we would either go to our C plane or align to world. And if we wanted to align to an object, we would change it to object. So this is really important. If I wanted to you know, extrude this face using this circle tab, it's way more likely I'm gonna wanna do it in the normal direction of this surface than I am to want to do it in the C plane direction uh, like this, okay? So it's important um, just to be aware that you can swap between those things, and we will do this a lot as we go through uh, and model in sub D. So just remember, aligning to the C plane or world is going to give you a much more defined X, Y, and Z um, directional transform, and aligning to the object is going to align to the very specific object that you're selecting in your tools. So to get the hang of some of the different sub-D tools, we're going to model up a collection of abstract objects based on a descriptive adjective. So the adjectives I've chosen for this tutorial include squashed, ribbed, splayed, crossed, and pinched. Um, and we're going to try and model something up that represents these adjectives just to get a feel for these tools. You can, of course, choose your own adjectives and practice as you go as well. So to do this, I'm just going to start a new Rhino file. So I'm going to go File, New. I'm not going to save changes to that. And I'm going to go Large Objects, Millimeters. And we'll go from there. So the first tool we're going to look at is the extrude tool, and we're going to try and create a squashed geometry using the extrude tool. So I'm going to just rotate around here and open my sub D tools, and we're going to create or start with a sub D box. I'm going to make sure my X, Y, and Z count are set to 1, 1, and 1, because I want that to be as low resolution as possible. And I'm just going to create a box that's 10, sorry, not 10. I want to create a box that is 100. So 100 by 100 by 100. There we go. I'll just change to shaded mode so we can see it. And we can tab between those to see our box preview. I'm in a model in um, smooth preview for now. And the extrude tool is actually up here where we've got extrude sub D. So we could click on that and we could start you know, clicking on a face. It'll prompt us to select the sub D faces or edges that we want to extrude and we'll press enter. And then it's going to ask us to, you know, extrude based on a direction of sorts, um, which is a little bit tricky because I want to extrude in this direction. Um, you can hold down the shift key and kind of get that and we'll get a bit of an object um, that gets extruded onto it. So if I hit the tab, you'll see that I now have a new kind of box. It's almost like two boxes are attached because I've extruded that face out. But I don't really want to keep using this command line and having to extrude over and over again. So I'm going to undo that guy. Instead, we're going to use the gumball. So I'm just going to make sure that my gumball is aligned to my object right now. I'm going to go shift control click into my gumball and I am going to extrude um, this guy out here. Uh, and what I might do um, is I might actually go and push him inwards a little bit. I'm just trying to see how that would work. And maybe scale him in uh, just a little bit. I think actually I might scale my geometry up um, just by double, just because I want a little bit more than I'm getting from the grid snap right now. So I've got a little bit of an extruded face going through in our object um, like that. So to get this squashed geometry, I'm going to try and create a few layers of squashing. So I'm going to shift control click into this surface here and do another little extrude. And then I'm going to scale this one up. So you start to see how we get this kind of squashed face um, or this appearance I'm going for. I'm going to click on this little bubble again and extrude another face out. Um, I might scale that guy down and pull him in. So I'm just swapping in between my smooth and unsmooth modes at the moment so I can really quickly manipulate this geometry. Now, 
I've kind of talked a little bit about selecting all the faces that we can in these objects, but I haven't talked much about selecting the edges. So I'm going to double click on this edge um, and I'm going to move him back a little bit. Basically double clicking on an edge will try and find things called a loop. So I'll do that again. If I double click on this edge, holding shift control click, you'll see how it selects the loop. One click will select that edge, but a double click will try and select that loop, which just gives me a little bit more control over the geometry um, that I'm kind of manipulating. So it's all about massaging the geometry until you're kind of happy with it. So I'm gonna make that a little bit smaller um, there. Then I might go and do another extrusion out here. Maybe I'll make this one a scaled up one to start to get a bit more squashing going on in that geometry. Uh, maybe slightly bigger and then we'll move this guy inwards just a little bit. In fact, maybe that guy wants to move outwards looking at that. Might actually scale this one up just a little bit as well and I'm holding shift to do um, a bit of a scale. And then I might actually um, select this loop here and maybe scale this outside guy up so we get a little bit of a casing around my squashed object. So then you can, of course, you know, go and tweak your geometry as you like, like moving these guys in, maybe moving him out to make him a little bit rounder. But that's kind of the basics as to how you might go ahead and start using the extrude component. So rather than using this command up here, it's much easier to shift control click into your object and extrude using the little dot that appears on the gumball. So one thing that's really helpful to do when you're modeling um, sub-D geometries is to make copies of these guys. So I'm going to hold down Alt and drag with my gumball to make a copy. Basically, if you say you've created a geometry you're really happy with, and then you continue manipulating it further, um, you might make a mistake or screw it up because it is a little bit of an exploratory modeling task, the sub-D tools. Uh, and it's really important to kind of make copies of the geometry as you go. So you have a record there. So if I go and experiment with this guy now, I always have this one sitting here as a reference um, to always come back to if I mess it all up somehow. Um, so make sure you're constantly making copies of your geometry as you go. I'm actually just scale this one up again. I feel like I underscaled these guys and I'm not getting the snap on the grids that I would have loved from the beginning. So I've got these two kind of geometries that are sitting here um, now that I've modeled up using my extrude component. What happens if we wanted to maintain the curvature of this object without having this unsmooth version that we see when we hit the tab button? In the sub-D tools, there's a command called subdivision that's going to enable us to add complexity um, and resolution to our geometry to hold its form uh, much more significant so that it doesn't become this kind of blocky mess once it's smoothed. And I'm going to demonstrate this first just by creating a sub-D plane here. Um, in fact, I'm going to make it without any well, one X and one Y, so it's just going to be a flat plane like that. And if I click on that guy, there's a tool in the SubD toolkit called Subdivide. So I'm going to hit Subdivide just here. And you can see straight away it's gone and added a subdivision to my geometry. So previously I had a you know one by one square, and now I've got a subdivision that's cutting me um, down the four. So what happens if I hit subdivision again? Basically what the subdivide tool is going to do is going to try and split each of these faces into four as well. So I'll go ahead and do that like that and it's starting to hold its um, form a little bit more compared to what it um, does in the original instance. So we can visualize this a little bit better with a box that's one by one by one. As we know that will subdivide into a sphere but if we um, add a few subdivisions like that we're basically creating a low resolution version of our smooth output. So in this instance if I grab this guy and I hit the, um, the subdivision tool here, you'll see my low resolution version of my squash geometry starts to look a lot like my um, high resolution object or our smooth version of that object. So it basically adds a little bit of complexity and allows us to hold that form, which is kind of sometimes important. I know I've mentioned that it's better to model in a lower resolution geometry, but there are some instances where you want to maintain or freeze that uh, level of smoothness in the low resolution version of the geometry.
The sub D toolkit also comes with a really fantastic and powerful um, tool called the reflect tool. So this isn't to be confused with the mirror tool in Rhino. So if I were to type mirror, you know it's going to happen. We're going to get just you know a copy um, mirrored version of the object we've selected. The reflect tool actually reflects our sub D geometry along an axis, deletes half of the geometry, um, and then joins it together with its reflection. And I'll demonstrate this live with my subdivided squashed object over here. So I'm going to just pull my squashed geometry over to the side here. Um, and I'm going to give it a slight rotation of negative 30 degrees like this. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to hover it over the top of this y-axis because I'm going to use the y-axis as my reflection plane. I might try and get it so it's just poking this um, edge here is just poking ahead of that y-axis, uh, just like that there. Um, so I'm going to come up to my subd tools toolbar, and I'm going to find the reflect subd object um, component here. So I'm going to click on that guy. It's going to ask me to apply this to a subd component, which will be this one here. And then we'll get the option to draw our own reflection plane, which you can do by clicking and drawing um, in a direction. I find it a lot easier to control if I'm just using one of the axes. In this case, I'm using the green or the Y axis. So I'm going to click on Y axis, um, and that'll serve as our reflection plane here. And then what it's going to do is it's going to ask us which side we want to keep. So remember how I said one side is going to be kept and then mirrored and joined on, and the other side is going to be deleted. I want to keep this side on the left here. So I'm going to just click arbitrarily on the left-hand side of the axis, uh, and then when it asks you to snap to the reflection plane, I'm just going to go with the automatic settings for now and hit enter. And you'll see I get a reflected and joined version of my geometry. So it makes my uh, initial squash geometry slightly more interesting, kind of like it's squashed from both directions. Um, and we also get this strange little shaded output um, based on the reflection uh, that we just kind of proposed on top of this geometry. Whenever you see this shaded reflection occurring after you've done a reflection on your sub-D component, make sure that you're aware that this means that a reflection is still applied to the object. So what that means is if I manipulate any part of this geometry, say if I shift control click onto one of these faces and I move that out, it's going to have the same effect on this side here, which is not always what you want. Sometimes it's really great because it means that we can do um, reflective transformations that might be relevant uh, to the modeling exercise we're doing, but sometimes you might just want to edit this side of the component. So to turn this reflection off, we need to go back into our reflect subject object um, option and click on one of the or click on the object that has been reflected and there's an option to remove existing reflect symmetry so I'm going to click on that guy and the shade of gray will be removed and now if I moved this face we can shuffle that object over there so I'm pretty happy with this squash geometry so I'm going to um, move these guys to the side and then we're going to start looking at how we might go ahead and model up a ribbed geometry Let's take a look at the bridge tool in the sub-D toolkit and try and create a ribbed geometry. So once again, we're going to begin with the primitive and I'm going to use the uh, mesh box tool. I'm going to make sure my X, Y, Z is 1, 1, and 1. I'm just going to kind of arbitrarily model up a bit of a rectangular object here. So I might just start by doing a bit of extruding with the gumball. I'll pull this guy up here. Uh, maybe move it around a little bit and give it a little bit of um, articulation, tiny bit of movement, so you can kind of see how it's a good little sketch tool. Um, I might move uh, out this way a little bit, and then maybe I'll, oops, maybe I'll extrude an object down this way, maybe down that way, and then maybe another one over here. Um, so what would happen if I wanted to uh, create a join between these two um, faces here? So this guy here and this guy here. The first thing I want to do is I want to imagine how that would happen. Essentially we're trying to create um, four new faces, one that would bridge on this side, another that would bridge on the outside, and then two that would cap the top and the bottom of that, and then we'd have to remove these two faces um, to enable that to happen. So we can do that, I might just go and shift control click on those two faces and just hit the delete button 
and we'll get these little holes in our sub D object. So if you toggle between smooth and unsmooth, you'll have a geometry that looks something like this. And to create this connection, we want to use something called the bridge tool. So the bridge tool can be found up here. It's got the little two arrows. I'm going to click on it. And it's going to ask us to um, select a first set of edges or faces to bridge. So I'm going to double click on this edge here. Um, and of course, when we double click, we're going to select that edge loop. And I'm going to hit enter. And then I've got to select the second set of edges to bridge. I'm going to double click over here. And our sub D tool should be smart enough to bridge between those two things, which you can see here. And you'll get a few little bridge options. So we can increase the number of segments that are occurring between this bridge. So if I increase this, you see we get more divisions that are occurring in that geometry. Um, we have the option to unjoin them or join them. Um, and then we have the option to change the crease value. Um, sorry, that was me just toggling with the tab key there. Um, I'm sorry, not the crease value, the straightness. So you get like a curvature through the object there. I'm going to go with one segment for this one, um, which you won't see any variation in the straightness here, and I'm just going to hit OK. Uh, and then we've managed to go ahead now and create kind of a nice ribbing effect uh, in our geometry. So I'm going to do a little bit more modeling on this. Um, what I might do is I might go ahead and keep um, extruding out with this guy. So grab that here, and then I might extrude this one up here. And then we could extrude that guy again, extrude him again, and extrude again like that. And then maybe we want to bridge between these two. Um, pretty sure we can actually just select the faces as well and use the bridge command through them. So if you don't want to delete those, that's a little bit of a shortcut that will enable you to uh, go and bridge between objects as well. And then you could start you know, adding even more complexity to this output by trying to uh, potentially extrude away in three dimensions. So maybe what we want to do is pull this guy out here, and then maybe we can go and select that one and just continuing to like slowly extrude and create geometry. Maybe we pull out this way, like that, and start to create um, really easily um, a bit more of a complex geometrical outcome. And then we can bridge between these guys again. This time I might add a couple of extra segments, like so to kind of create my ribbed geometry. And I'll keep extruding out here. And sometimes to make the form a little bit more organic, it's good to um, you know, add some variation to that guy. I'll extrude that one up here again. And then we could bridge between these two here. I'll make the segments one, just like that. So go ahead and practice some of your um, extruding and bridging together in tandem. See if you can create some kind of ribbed geometry similar to what I've been able to create with those tools. Uh, once you're happy with it, we can start moving on and looking at another tool as well. Maybe I'll bridge this guy here actually just as one last little bridge like that. So we get a nice kind of 3D ribbed effect coming through that object. So now we've got a squash geometry, an unmirrored squash geometry, and a ribbed geometry. And I might just label these. Squashed. Oops, squashed. Oops. Not going to let me scale, that's annoying. Ribbed. Cool. And the next geometry we're going to create is splayed.
Actually, one last thing that I might mention about this ribbed geometry is you might have noticed so far in all of our sub-D modeling, we've created only uh, quad faces or faces with four sides, basically. And sometimes in our underlying mesh topology, or sorry, sometimes in our underlying sub-D topology, we want to make use of triangular faces. So say, for example, here, I want to transition uh, to a more smoother kind of turn of this corner rather than getting this hard edge, I might want to create a more triangular element uh, for this little piece here. And I can do that by very simply just selecting that edge there and deleting it. And you'll see I get a much more smoother transition of that uh, geometry coming through there. I might want to do the same up here. So if you're ever looking for a smoother transition of your geometry, just be aware that you can try and use some triangular faces mixed in with the quad or um, four-sided faces in your sub-D modeling. And it's very much about trying to pick and choose uh, the correct moments where you want to actually go ahead and use those triangular faces instead of the quad faces. Um, so just be aware for those more smooth transitions to try and test out some of those triangular faces with this modeling technique. So let's take a look now at the edge loop tool with the sub-D toolkit. And we can try and create um, a geometry that would be described as a splayed geometry making use of the edge loop tool. So once again, I'm gonna start with a sub-D box that's one by one by one in the X, Y, and Z axes. I'm going to make it a little bit more rectangular this time. Um, and I'm going to just swap into unsmooth mode with the tab. And we're going to come up here to the insert edge loop or edge, ling, uh, edge ring tool. So I'm going to click on that. Um, normally in like Blender or Maya, I always go for what I'd call loop. I've never actually really heard of ring, I don't think, until I've gotten into sub D with Rhino, but I want to go with Ring from my experimentation so far with it. Ring, if we click on one of these edges, we'll try and select all of the uh, edges in our geometry that are kind of, you know, running perpendicular to one another. And if I hit enter, what it'll enable us to do is to create basically a ring of edges around our output. So I'm just going to click one here and I'm going to do it again. I want to do a ring and create them you know, here, and then we'll create another ring going around this side, like so. In fact, I actually wanted to do it this way, so we'll just go and perk that up uh, like that. And I actually also wanted, in fact, I want to add one extra um, ring to this, so in here, and I might just slide this edge over like that and like that. Um, so what I'm going to try and create from this is a geometry that's almost like a branching effect that splays out from lots of different directions as we kind of move up. So I'm actually going to extrude from multiple faces this time. Um, so I'm going to hit the extrude button like that. And what they'll actually do is they'll all stick together. So they're not separate boxes that we've extruded up. If we extruded them one by one, um, like if I did this, then this, You'll notice if I grab the top face, it's disconnected from its neighbor. But when you extrude them all together, that disconnect doesn't occur and the faces get stuck to one another. So I'll kind of move those guys over to the side here like that. And I'm going to do the same for these four up here. We're going to extrude up and move it across like that. And then we can start splaying out again. So I'm going to splay out individually now. So I might actually grab these two move them across like that, grab these two, extrude up, and move out across like that. I grab these two, extrude, oops, didn't get the extrude there, got the move, extrude up, and move across like this, and then these ones as well, we'll extrude up, missed it again, can be a bit frustrating sometimes, and then we'll move them across like that. So we're starting to get a little bit of a branching effect in our geometry. And now that I've got all of those ones, I can start to go and create some branching effects. So if I hit tab, you'll see I get quite a blobby kind of geometry coming through here. Um, I might just manipulate these things a little bit, like maybe we move these edge rings over a little bit get a little bit more of a splay coming out um, in this geometry type. So as always, 
your sub D modeling is a little bit by eye, trying to you know massage that into an output that you're kind of happy with uh, until you kind of splay that thing out a little bit. So you can sit around and manipulate this yourself until you get a nice splay through. Cool, so there's my splayed geometry. Um, I'm not super happy with it. So let's try and add some articulation to our splayed object using something called the crease tool uh, in the sub D modeling toolkit. So the crease tool essentially um, turns our softer edges into hard edges. So for example, if I have this edge here um, and I come up to the crease tool, which sits here called add crease and I click on it, you'll notice that the preview of that outcome becomes very much closer to the hard edge that we see in the unsmooth geometry. And I can go and, you know, add a few of these creases into my geometry. So hit crease like that. Um, and it gives me a very different articulation on the representation of my object. <clears throat> so I might add some creases to the top as well. Could type increase like that. In fact, I might add creases to the overall top because I don't like these blobby edges that I've got going on up here like that and maybe a bit of articulation to these kind of interior ones as well. That a little bit looks a bit better. And then we can, oops, we can start to manipulate, you know, this geometry a little bit more. Um, we could also, with the creases, um, our kind of uncreased outputs can give us a little bit more of a um, articulation on the surface. So if we move those guys in, uh, maybe we can crease the bottom so we have a flat base. So I'll go and crease at the bottom. Um, and then I'll once again move these guys in. So we get a bit of jaggedness coming through in our splayed object like that. And it really looks, it starts to feel like those are splitting. I wonder if, um, if we crease this yeah, that probably adds a little bit to it, so we could crease that interior edge. I'm not sure if creasing the whole loop's going to be aesthetically pleasing, but we can see. Oh, it's not bad, actually. Um, so creasing gives us a little bit more of, um, you know, articulation and change in the way we're representing that geometry from uh, the more jagged version to the smooth one. It just gives us those nicer, harder edges that sometimes are a little bit welcome so you don't get too lost in the blobs like we did in the rib geometry just before. So I'm pretty happy with that splay geometry. Um, I'm going to move all of these objects over here. Just move that guy there. And next we're going to have a look at the bevel command in the sub D and we're going to look at it in conjunction with creating a crossed geometry. So I'll just get a crossed adjective out here. So as always, I'm going to start with a sub D box, um, one by one by one in the X, Y, and Z account. Uh, and I'm actually going to start by rotating it by 45 degrees. Uh, I'll move it up here and just make sure you have your gumball set to align to object right now. So I'm going to select in on this face and extrude out uh, twice. And I might do this in unsmooth mode so I get a nice evenness through these extrusions. Um, so I'll extrude again here. Uh, and then I might extrude out here. So I'm creating a bit of a cross quite literally with my geometry. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, and we'll extrude here. So if we go to smoothly start to get that, I might go one extra out. So two extrusions on each kind of leg of the cross. And the arms as well, like that. And so we have a nice crossed geometry here. Cool, and so what we're going to do is uh, coming up to our um, insert edge ring tool. Um, I'm going to make sure I select ring and we're going to actually add a ring going along here. So I'll hit enter and go down the middle of there and we're going to do a similar one on this side. So edge loop ring like that. 
just to add a little bit more detail and you'll see the cross starts to hold it form a little bit uh, more easily. So we already have like something that looks a little bit like a cross geometry here. What I want to do is basically try and add a little bit more articulation and detail to the surface of this cross. So I am going to now select the bevel tool in the sub D toolkit. And so the bevel tool is just up here. And what it enables to do is it um, lets us uh, do something with the edges that basically kind of splits them off and adds detail to them. So I'm going to do it to this edge loop first and hit enter. And you'll see what it does is it goes from one segment and extends it out to two. So essentially um, we're going from a really kind of smooth rounded um, cross here and we're kind of trying to turn that into something a little bit more um, rectangular but also that just has a little bit more detail. So I'll do that for that side. I'm going to do the same thing here and just extend that off. We can add uh, detail to this so we can do like five segments to the bevel um, and really add detail but for the purposes of this modeling task we want to have about one just like that. So now we've gone using the bevel tool and added in a collection of faces in our cross geometry. And the next step here that I want to kind of uh, try and do is basically select this interior cross that we've now created and extrude out from that guy to create a little bit more articulation. Um, I'm not super happy with the way these edges are forming, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select uh, these guys and because we're um, moving our gun boy or manipulating via object if I select those four they're all in alignment and I can actually scale them inwards nicely um, I might turn my grid snap on sorry I turned off by accident and we're able to kind of real with a lot of control just manipulate the size of that cross that we've got coming um, on top of our crossed geometry so I'll select these four now, move those guys in, these four as well, and move those guys in. So you can kind of see what we're doing a little bit there. Maybe what we want to do is make it even more defined and um, potentially move these ones in so we get like... Um, in the unsmooth version it's a bit truncated inwards but what it does is it just highlights that kind of joint that we've got there so we can go and do that for this one as well move them in this one here and this last one here we can do the same thing just move it in like that so we get a little bit more articulation on our geometric face so now that we've got our cross geometry, um, we can use some of this sub-D modeling to our advantage uh, by doing some freeform editing with uh, this output in Rhino. What I'm first going to do is I'm going to do a copy of this guy because I'm kind of happy with the cross geometry that we've got. Um, in fact, I'll move him over here to the side so I can clearly move some things around. So because we have this um, you know, control over shift control click every time we go into our sub-D geometry, we can quite easily just, you know, select a kind of part of the geometry that we want to quickly manipulate. And I'm going to try and select the middle part of my cross geometry here. And what this enables us to do is really quickly kind of just move things around. I'm going to change over to uh, our world plane here. And I'm going to try and create a little bit of a... Um, almost distorted cross instead like we could even potentially try and do a bit of a distortion through rotation and movement here uh, so we just get something that's a little bit more dynamic and you know it's really easy for you to control these things by just moving um, or selecting multiple kind of faces and vertices in the sub d and just easily manipulating them. You can even select the edge loops like that. Um, so all of that control immediately gives us you know, the ability to go from what's a very symmetrical cross to something that's much more dynamic by um, doing a bit of freeform editing and you know, making the most of these sub-D tools in Rhino. So I'm pretty happy with that cross. I might move all these guys over and we'll get on to our last adjective, um, which was a pinched geometry. So I'll go and type in pinched like that. 
And to create our pinched geometry, we're going to take a look at the stitch tool in the sub D uh, modeling catalog as well. Um, I'm going to start with a primitive, and for once, I'm not going to start with a box. I'm actually going to go and start with a sub D plane, and I'm just going to make the X and Y count one and one, and we'll just model a little plane out here like this. Oops. So what I'm going to try and do here, I'm going to kind of do this pretty quickly. I'm just going to pull out a little bit of this geometry. In fact, maybe what we do instead actually is we'll model our plane and we'll give it an X count of three and a Y count of three like this. And I'm just going to delete the middle um, of that geometry like that. So I've got a bit of a hole in it. Might make the hole slightly bigger than what it currently is. Um, and I'm going to move it up a little bit. And we're going to extrude these three faces downwards, like this. I might move them across. Oops, I didn't want to do that. Just get those three edges again and move them across. So we're starting to get a geometry that starts to look a little bit like that. And then I'm going to extrude down again. And I'll move it across here. And what I want to do is actually try and align this guy here, this guy over here, oops. So we're almost aligning to the edges. In fact, we can align to the edges. So I'm going to use a just a normal Rhino tool uh, command because we are able to actually manipulate our sub-D geometry with very typical Rhino um, controls. So I'm going to use the set point command in this instance and I'm going to align the points of this um, edge here to what looks like the Y axis, so I'm going to set all the Ys. No, it's the X that I want to do it, because they're all at this X value, that's right. And that'll just nicely align it to um, that edge, but on the same plane that I had before. I can do the same thing with this guy. And then I'm going to move this one out a little bit. In fact, I want to move him in. I think I've put the wrong ones out for my pinch geometry. Yeah, I have a little bit. So how's that looking? It's not bad. Maybe what we want to do is just give a little bit more breathing room to these vertices here, like that. So we're kind of getting this funnel that's coming through in our pinched outcome. I'm going to rotate that guy by 45. And then once again, I'm going to use a um, more typical Rhino command, which is going to be the mirror command. So I'll just mirror. Um, that guy here, and now we have two separate sub-D geometries. But what we're going to do is we're going to stitch up these edges so they become one geometry. We can, and we can use that by using this stitch mesh um, or sub-D edges tool up here. So I'm going to click on that. It's going to ask me um, the first set of verte set vertices or edges. So I'm going to go with these three here and hit enter. And then these three here is my second set. And it'll go and stitch those guys up nicely. And I'm going to do the same thing for the top. So I'm going to hit enter again. Or we'll just click on it. So stitch. Oops. Is that the first set, which is those three? Hit enter. Select the second set, which is not that one. Those three. And we'll align it to the middle here. Like that. And now we've stitched those two pieces of geometry together and we've created kind of this kind of pinched outcome. So to accentuate the pinching of this geometry, I'm actually going to um, pull in these edges a little bit like that and really get a pinching outcome coming through. Maybe we can pinch these guys in as well. And then just for you know, argument's sake, we've got this kind of like pinching idea coming through. I want to potentially pinch these edges in a little bit. So a lot of your sub-D modeling is tweaking um, aesthetic changes based on, you know, the design intent you're going for. Um, you could even start to think about, you know, giving this a little bit more form. So maybe this guy could go upwards and then these ones could go down, so it's almost a bit more of an undulating effect, or maybe they could go up. Depends on what you want to kind of get as an output here. 
Maybe you can get a bit of asymmetry through those geometries as well. Like that. And there's our pinch geometry. Cool. So there's our collection of final geometries that we've gone and created. Um, and hopefully that's been an interesting crash course into some of the sub D tools that you can use in Rhino. Um, following on from this, I'd highly recommend you try and pick your own adjectives and go and, you know, practice with some of these tools we've looked at in this course and see if you can create your own um, little geometries is a good exercise to get familiar with the sub D modeling toolkit in Rhino.